Salem is one of the most interesting stories told in FGO. It stands out in people's minds as being a story that, regardless if you loved it or hated, is drastically tonally different from anything else that FGO has ever presented. Being a member of the Epic of Remnant chapters, Salem has one of the most experimental stories written, so today I want to take a deep dive look into what was up with Salem. Obviously, spoilers ahead. If you are coming to this video having seen my Agartha one, know out the gate that I loved Salem. This is not going to be a vicious ripping apart and scalding review of awful failed potential like Agartha was, but rather an examination of what went right and what really didn't in Salem. More than anything, Salem has a tone to it. Throughout the entire chapter, there's just a fog of discomfort around everything that gives the story a level of tension that fate very often attempts to go for but fails to capitalize on. Our introduction to this chapter isn't that we are time traveling to a distant land, but rather that something has happened in the modern day, and the actual world of FGO is attempting to figure out what it is. 50,000 people have just up and vanished in the area of Salem, Massachusetts, which is now covered in a black misty dome that consumes all life and technology sent into it. Immediately, we are met with something mysterious and unique that poses a threat that we don't understand. Naturally, it is our job to go and figure out what's going on, but our crew chosen for the mission appears somewhat lopsided, with two members already at each other's throats in Robin and Sanson, Neza, who is new and still needs to figure out what her current manifestation entails, Mash, who is completely unable to fight, Matahar, who by virtue of being Matahari seems like a bad fit for a Puritan setting, and Medea who isn't actually Medea. It's certainly a unique crew of characters and not one I would consider to be the best fit for Salem, but because of this awkward placement of characters it adds depth to the overall story. Then there is what really sets Salem aside from pretty much every other FGO chapter. After arriving in Salem, it is discovered that every servant has falsely manifested. Described in-game as if they were crammed into a human body, the servants that we have brought with us will now actually die when they are killed. Should a servant die, their memories of their manifestation at Chaldea will disappear, and while they can still be resummoned, everything will have to start over at square one. So, for the first time in FGO in a non-geisha setting, real stakes have been put on the line. I want you to go back and think about every single singularity or loss belt that you can, and think about how often it is that a servant is permitted to die for the story. During the singularities, you're lucky if you leave with half the servants that you go in with. So, whenever a servant dies in other stories, it can be sad and we'll miss them, but we know that they'll pop back up the same as ever once we wrap up the singularity. Salem slaps that safety net out of your hand completely and screams at you, If you die in Massachusetts, you die for real. To date, no other FGO story has covered this concept in NA on this scale. Quite frankly, it's a genius way to add tension to your writing, and Salem takes full advantage of this angle. Salem continuously throws new threats and problems at you as its story progresses forward, each growing in magnitude so that you as the reader are never really given a proper moment of respite. Your servants operate on half capacity for the singularity due to them being falsely incarnated, communications are jammed because of an unknown interference, and the people of the town don't trust us because we are a band of thespians and because Sanson is French. Mash straight up vanishes and is almost killed by wolves, characters that we get to know throughout the story are actually hanged and killed, and the introductions of one of fate's most notorious glorious bastards, Witchfinder General Hopkins. All of this occurring while we try to uncover what is actually going around the town of Salem, and searching for any evidence of the demon god that is likely the root and cause of everything, while slowly realizing that some outside force is manipulating our memories. Salem's story reflects the source material it is trying to emulate incredibly well, that of a Lovecraftian tale, that slowly teases out hints on the truth of the matter, while remaining at an arm's length to keep you in the dark. As someone who loves cosmic horror and Lovecraft's writing style, Salem nails it. That is, up until the end. See, I have two major problems with Salem. One that can be fixed, and another that cannot. Let's start with the former. Salem, at its core, is a character study. It plays around with the question of, what would this character do in this situation? Take the relationship between Robin Hood and Sanson. Fate finally addresses something that it usually sweeps under the rug by exploring the interpersonal relationships between the characters that by all historical accounts should hate each other. This is normally lazily explained away with the pretense of, well we're fighting under the same master now so no helping it, and then it just never gets addressed after. Worse yet is that some characters have their entire personalities written to be only their feud with one person, like Edison and Tesla. The only time aside from this that they take these interactions even somewhat seriously happened all the way back in Summer 2 when Boudicca admits that she despises the fact that she has to work alongside Nero after everything that the Romans did to her and that she would kill her if she could. The infrequency in which this happens makes moments like these stand out. So, seeing them actively explore the differences between a vigilante who acts to help those who 
the Crown takes advantage of in Robin Hood, and a physical representation of justice against the enemies of the Crown in Sanson is a brilliant piece of writing added on. The relationship between these two adds so much additional tension to the story, and the difference in their actions makes you begin to question which one is correct in their assessment of the other. Sanson is genuinely the most compelling character in Salem. I would go so far as to say that Salem is a story about Sanson. Let me explain. Salem is a town overtaken by madness, where the law is often skirted in favor of following emotion. Sanson, as he is portrayed in Fate, is someone who cares very deeply for upholding the law, even if it is in a world where nothing makes sense. It is in his nature to try and make sure that everything is fair for both the convicted and the accuser. This is the reason why Sanson decides to side with Hopkins once he appears, as this is an attempt to give sway towards rational thinking over emotional conviction. In every sense, he is attempting to be a mediator for all that is happening, and as the story progresses even further, we come to realize that Sanson's inherent good nature and genuine care for others is what is preventing Hopkins from having him executed. What you may not remember from Salem, because every time Hopkins is on screen you are filled with a mixture of fear and hatred, is that Hopkins does have a moment near the very end where he comes to realize that something is actually wrong. It is revealed that by this time, Hopkins should already be dead, and that his actions here are done as him believing that he is atoning for his own sins that he performed in Europe. Does any of this sound familiar? This is because Hopkins is written to be a manifestation of the person that Sanson fears he is seen as, a brutal executioner whose primary concern is making sure that the accused are doled out their punishments to make sure that they have no chance of ever causing harm again, and if some innocents have to die to preserve the peace of the many, then it is worth their sacrifice. Sanson is terrified of the prospect of being seen and remembered as a cold-blooded murderer. All of this comes to a head when Lavinia murders Hopkins, and in order to save her, Sanson willingly takes the fall and allows himself to be executed and remembered by the townsfolk in Salem as a cold-blooded murderer. This is indicative of him accepting what the actions of his life left on his eternal name, and that he would happily die with this knowledge than to have to live without it. So what does this have to do with the ending of Salem being lackluster? Well, that is because they invested so much into making the story about Sanson that they didn't explore the character that becomes the key to everything, pun intended, Abigail Williams. Abby's role in Salem feels almost shoehorned in so that she could be added to the game and then maybe have her fleshed out later on. Throughout the story of Salem, Abby has one primary occupation and only one, be cute and kind of mysterious, and in that role, she excels. However, this does not make for a compelling lead character. Abby herself feels much more akin to a side character that the writers really liked, and so they decided to write her into becoming more important than she actually is. Before a slew of angry comments come in, here's a picture of my level 100 Abigail to prove I don't hate her. Cool, moving on. Abby is a character with a ton of potential in Salem that doesn't really go anywhere until the very last minute. To outline what we learn about Abby before the big reveal of the story at the end, here is what we learn about her. Her parents were killed by Native Americans, which is later revealed to have been a wagon accident. She likes Tichuba and learns some magic from her. She wants to be friends with the other girls of the town, including Lavinia, who is later shown to have been wished there by Abigail for the purpose of being her friend. Abby is terrified of the thought of leaving Salem, because outside of Salem is where her parents died. Finally, she speaks for Lane in her sleep as an indicator that she has something eldritch inside of her. The story of Salem feels like it has to constantly remind you that Abigail is a part of it, and because this is an Epic of Remnant chapter, the villain is spoiled by who is on Raid Up. We can figure out fairly quickly that Abby is supposed to have story significance. However, she mostly just sits back until a man with a bird head grey washes her and slaps a cartoon key sticker on her head. It feels very unearned and out of place. If this scenario had played out the same way, but it was Lavinia instead who took on being the one to be possessed by Soot Typhoon, and it took Abby finally having a breakthrough with her and her purity being what corrected the corruption, that would make for a significantly better setup and conclusion. Instead, Lavinia will sit in NPC hell for a while longer. Then comes the actual ending, which just feels… off. Randolph Carter, who up to this point has had his body hijacked by Rom, kind Wow! That was intense! Woo! I just flew in from the new ruins level and boy are my arms tired! He offers to take Abby on a journey through the cosmos to see the universe and maybe find a way to reconnect with Lavinia, and Abby gets over her trauma of leaving Salem and accepts. She is then whisked off to unknown parts of the universe. This entire segment is fan service to Lovecraft fans because Randolph Carter is a Lovecraft character who explores the universe, so it's a decent wink and nod towards fans of the source material. However, it is an incredibly bland way to wrap up a psychological thriller, and Fate only addresses its existence one other time in Abby's interlude, to my knowledge. 
If at all possible, I would love to see this circled back on in a future event, and then maybe give us a summonable Randolph Carter who then true names into being Lovecraft. That'd be pretty cool, and given that it looks like JP is starved for content and ideas at the moment, I'm just a Discord message away lasagna. I will give credit that the ending scene where Sanson is taught to dance by the spirit of Marie is very touching and puts a nice bow on what I can only describe as his redemption arc. So that's what I believe can be helped and adjusted. Abby was shoehorned in as the lead when Sanson carried the entire show and still has no animation update to show for it, but what can't be helped? Well, Salem is held back and severely so by it being in FGO. Salem as a story is by and large phenomenal. Salem as a chapter in FGO that you have to play through is a slog. By the nature of it being in FGO, Salem has to have the story constantly interrupted by fights that have to be done with weakened servants so they take longer before you can get back to what is actually compelling about Salem. More so than in any other chapter, the fights feel completely unnecessary and even contradictory to the story at times. A major point of the Salem chapter is that these are great heroes across time that have been weakened down to being like normal people, so still having them fight off undead monsters, wolves, and eldritch horrors just feels out of place. Even more so that after taking down something that Robert Chambers saw in a nightmare, the characters are having a conversation about how they can't just brute force things. It becomes incredibly confusing to the overall narrative that Salem wants to try and get across. I want you to right now genuinely think of any memorable fights that you had in Salem. Odds are, you remember fighting Abby who would resurrect herself, and then maybe the first time you fought in Elder Tor. Did you remember the first fight with the wolves? The brawl with the sailors at the tavern after one grabbed Neza's ass? The fight with the corpse of Tichuba? I would wager for the most part, no. The fights add absolutely nothing to Salem's narrative, and with Salem being almost wholly focused on its narrative, grinding everything going on to a halt does an incredible amount of damage to the overall story. There are other aspects of Salem that stand out as being just weird and out of place as well, like Mephistopheles just showing up under the excuse of his hobby being that he explores hellscapes, Neza's overall addition to this chapter feels meaningless because her role is so minor. If you're curious to know what her role is, it is because in this current manifestation she is a protector of children, so her job is to protect Abigail, but even in that it just feels kind of weird and wrong. The revelation that Medea was Cersei it was predictable once again because of the raid up, so that went nowhere. Same thing can be said for Tichuba and the Queen of Sheba. A standout performance, I would say, should go to Mata Hari because she proved to be the most competent servant that we brought, second only maybe to Sansen. Mata Hari was amazing to watch in action, and seeing her actually put her spy and espionage skills to use was really fun. Also, still no animation update for her either. Salem, in my mind, is the strongest of the Epic of Remnant chapters, and for that, I do appreciate it, but it does highlight the particular issue of how the medium affects the final product. I hope that we can see more chapters like Salem in the future, because it's a genuine shame that its darker theming has yet to be explored again. And that is it. Thank you all so much for watching. Like I said, I have much nicer things to say about Salem, but I do have more to say about the other Epic of Remnant chapters, so if you're at all interested in that, subscribe to make sure that you catch those when they come up. For now though, let me know what you thought down in the comments. Like the video if you liked it, check out my links for my Discord, Twitch, and Twitter. But for now guys, keep your chin up. Peace. This video is sponsored by my YouTube members. Here is your monthly shout out. Pran, Ao Kafisama, Heliman Nero, The Champ One. Thank you for supporting me and keeping the content flowing.